we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about something that we that was introduced back in Gen Chem One, and that was make how do you make a solution? So all all along in Gen Chem, we've pretty much just been talking about pure substances, which is one of the two categories of matter. Okay. So usually those pure substances involve talking about elements or chemical compounds. But now what we want to start doing is talking about mixtures. Okay, and remember that when we classify mixtures, we could classify mixtures as being heterogeneous mixtures or they could be homogeneous mixtures. Okay. So we haven't really talked about mixtures a whole lot in, in chemistry, but one of our goals for this chapter is to further refine what a mixture is. So what is the difference between a heterogeneous mixture and a homogeneous mixture? Well, for a heterogeneous mixture, a heterogeneous mixture means that mixing is usually non-uniform. And the composition is going to vary by region. Okay. Homogeneous mixers, the mixing is uniform, and the composition is constant throughout the, the solution throughout the mixture. Okay, now homogeneous mixtures can actually be broken down into two more categories. Okay, so you could have a solution, which is what we talked about uh, at the, you know, halfway through uh, Gen Chem 1. So solutions are particles with diameters between 0 0.1 nanometers and 2 nanometers. You could also have a colloid or a colloid, however you'd like to say it. Colloids have particles between 2 nanometers to 500 nanometers. Okay, so based on this, how would you categorize blood? Would it be a solution? Would it be a collid? Or would it be something else? Well, if we want to categorize blood, uh, blood would actually be a suspension. Okay, because blood is not uniform. And it also contains larger particles like proteins and nucleic acids. Okay. All right. And I just went back a page. All right. Now, back in Gen Chem 1, we talked about solutions a little bit. So what are the two components of a solution? Well, you've got a solute and then you've got solvent. Okay. So the way, if you guys remember, the solute, this is what's being dissolved. And then the solvent, this is the dissolver. Okay, so usually it, we talk about the solute and the solvent in terms of how much of material you have. Solute, this is the material that's there, the minor amount, the smaller of the two. The solvent, this is the part that's the major. This is the one that's there more. Okay, now we come into contact with many different solutions in our lives. And this table kind of gives you an example of, of the types of solutions that's possible. So you could have a gas solute in a gas solvent. You could have a gas solute in a liquid solvent like carbonated water. You could have a liquid that's dissolved in a solid. Uh, you could have a liquid that's dissolved in a liquid, a solid that's dissolved in a solid. So primarily what we're going to talk about in this chapter, we're going to focus on gases that are dissolved in liquids, and we're also going to look at liquids or solids that are dissolved in liquids. So those are the two primary ones that we're going to focus on. 
Okay. Now, all solutions, except for those containing gases, involve forces that hold together components into a condensed phase. These forces are called intermolecular forces. Okay, we talked about this back in the last chapter. Now, given that there are two components in a solution, okay, so you got solutes, you got solvents, what are the three different interactions between the pairs of the components? What are they? So you could have one possibility is that you have a solvent molecule interacting with a solvent molecule. So you could have solute-solute interactions. You could have a solute molecule interacting with another solute molecule. Okay, And then finally, the third type of interaction, the one that we're really concerned about, the solute molecule interacting with the solvent. Okay, so we're going to talk more about those three types of interactions a little bit. But uh, when we take a look at those, you know, how do we, when we take a look at those three interactions, how do we measure, you know, what, which ones are the strongest, which one are the, are the weakest? So usually... The solute solute interactions are going to be the lowest. You know, they're going to, they're going to be the weakest. F follow that up with solvent, solvent. They're going to be somewhat stronger. And then finally, you're going to have solute interacting with solvent. And these are going to be the strongest. So, this is the one that we're going to focus in on the most. Okay, now when we talked about dissolving things back in Chapter 4, back in Gen Chem 1, when we talked about making a solution for the first time, what was the phrase that we used when we're dissolving compounds? We said that if it's a polar compound, like, will dissolve like. Okay, so that's kind of the key phrase that we use in, in how to make a solution. We make sure that a polar compound, to dissolve it, we need a polar solvent. Okay, so how do we make a solution? So I, you saw something kind of similar to this, this picture, this figure, back in Gen Chem 1. And we talked about how we make a solution. And remember... Uh, the process of using, let's say, if water is our solvent, that process is called hydration. All right, so how does this work? Well, so what we're doing is we're taking, if we take a crystal of sodium chloride and put it inside, you know, some, some water, the water molecules start to hit the surface of the crystal. And so what the water molecules are trying to do is to break out these ions. So if you notice, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, you've got two water molecules, the partially negative oxygen, okay, and that, let me note that, the partially negative oxygens are trying to hit the sodium, okay, and the purple ones are the sodium. So they're trying, these water molecules are trying to dislodge the sodium. And also, if we take a look at the other side, where we have a chloride ion, we have the partially positive hydrogen ions. The partially positive hydrogens are trying to dislodge the chloride ions. So basically, we have these water molecules that are trying to beat up on a crystal and trying to free those ions. And once an ion is free then those ions are surrounded by these water molecules. So I'm showing four here, but it's actually six because you've got one that's going to be on the top of the sodium ion and have one on the bottom. And same thing for the chloride ion. Now the only difference, if you notice how the water molecules are positioned, for the sodium ion, you've got the partially negative oxygen that's going to be surrounding the sodium ion. For the chloride ion, it's the partially positive hydrogens that are going to be surrounding the chloride ion. Okay, so if you ever take a, uh, if you know the phrase, every picture tells a story, this actually tells us a lot, let, you know, this actually tells us a story. So which atom is attracted to the sodium ion? It's the oxygen from water. And then which atoms are attracted to the 
high, the chloride ion, or it's the hydrogens. Okay, oxygen again, it's going to be partially negatively charged, the hydrogens partially positively charged. Okay, now how many water molecules are going to be attracted to each ion? Approximately, it's going to be six. One on the top, one on the bottom, and then four on the sides. Now, what kind of intermolecular force is being used in this scenario? Because you've got a polar water molecule surrounded by an ion, this is going to be ion-dipole interactions. Okay, now what if, now let, let's think a little bit more critically about this. Is dissolution going to be easier for smaller particles or larger particles and why? And so for dissolution, is it going to be easier to break a, a larger particle or a smaller one? Well, it's going to be a smaller one. Smaller ones are easier because smaller ones will have more edges. And that means that water can make a better contact with the crystals and the ions. with the crystal and the ions. Okay, so what are some of the interactions that we see below? Remember that we had a sodium ion, so let me draw that. Okay, so you got the sodium ion, and this is gonna be attracted to the partially negatively charged oxygen. Okay. So you're going to have six of these. So I'm only going to draw a couple of these water molecules. Okay. And likewise, for the chloride ion, the chloride ion is going to be attracted to the hydrogens from the water molecules. Okay. Now the word solvated is used to describe the association of a solvent with a solute. Now if that solvent is water, there's a more specialized term and we call it hydrated. Okay. In this process, instead of calling it solvation, we call it hydration. Now, a major consideration in the dissolution process is the energy available for when this process starts. What is that energy called? We call it Gibbs free energy. or we refer to it as delta G. All right, and now, in order to talk about a solution this time around, we need to talk, we need to talk about thermodynamics. So this is a good point to, to stop, and let's review some materials from Gen Chem 1, especially thermodynamics.